I'm with the global campaign organisation Avast to listen to what people think about the kind of Murdoch media that exists not just in Australia but in the United Kingdom and in America and you, you know in the United Kingdom Parliament's interest in News Corp started with phone hacking, a criminal trial that involved uh, the hacking of a, an abducted teenage schoolgirl's phone. It's led to 130 a arrests. But more importantly, in the UK, it gave us a real t chance to have a long, hard look at media ethics in our country. And what we realise about the Murdoch stable of papers in particular is they don't just back political parties, they back particular candidates. And it seems to me that his company, despite him saying they've learned from the scandal in the UK, they've not learnt any lessons and they're sort of backing candidates in this campaign, which frankly insults voters. It doesn't give them the choice, it doesn't report the news in the way that people in an election really deserve and uh, it, I hope to start a conversation about that. What, what's wrong with any paper putting their editorial opinion on the front page? Just to make it absolutely clear, you buy the Daily Telegraph or the Herald Sun, you know exactly what line this paper's taking. I think it's fair to, to say, you know, it's absolutely right that papers should be t take a tough line in elections, take strong editorial lines, even stick it on the front page, but, you know, go a little further and give voters the choice about what different political parties are saying. You've just shown that ballot paper. There's obviously a lot of views in Australia. People have stand for lots of different positions. And judging from what I've seen in some of the key sort of papers in important seats like the Courier Mail or Daily Telegraph, they're not, the voters aren't really seeing that reflection of the debate that political parties want to see in a general election. And that's not fair to voters. It corrodes democracy and it's quite corrosive to the political system. If it if it takes place over time, particularly during an election. But it's, it's a difficult argument for you to run though because just as many Australians resent being dictated to by their newspapers, they also do resent what's seen as an outsider coming to town and saying, ah, yeah. this is what's going wrong in your culture and your publications, I need to point that out to Absolutely. you. Absolutely. For heaven's sake, please don't think that I'm coming here to tell Australians how to vote. That's down to them. But, not not, not but how uh, to vote, but what might be right or wrong well, with its publishing hope, culture. Well, I hope that the sort of experience that I've had in investigating Rupert Murdoch's company over three continents now would have help inform that debate, you know, uh, what we found in the UK was the, these newspapers, the tabloid papers, over many years they've got a reputation for being quite witty, for quite cleverly written, for using sort of comedy and photo stories to tell a proper news story. But then for the five to six weeks of a general election campaign they sort of morph into propaganda sheets and I just hope that I can help inform that debate and people can sort of say whether they actually want that to happen or not. Your experience of being outspoken about the Rupert Murdoch press has led to a, a rather extraordinary intervention in your own life by the press itself. Can you explain that to those who might not be aware of it? Yeah, when, we, uh, when my committee in Parliament started to look at the sort of phone hacking scandal in the UK, um, it was confirmed by their chief reporter of the News of the World that they, 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 they actually put us all under surveillance and so I've been following by Rupert Murdoch's private investigators and uh, other MPs have had their phone hacked. There's an investigation into computer hacking, uh, you know, and the criminal inquiries have been looking at sort of bribery of public officials, including very senior anti-terrorist officers. So we exposed a sort of a, a culture of criminality that uh, showed a corporate culture that thought they weren't just beyond political account but beyond the law. And have there been consequences for the, the circulation and the success of the Murdoch Press in the UK following the scandal? Yes, I mean, they, they closed the best-selling newspaper in the world, the News of the World. I mean, of, of course, world. apart um, from that, have people boycotted the papers at all? Well, they, in some cities, the newspapers are boycotted. The, in Liverpool, for example, nobody buys the Sun newspaper. But uh, it's hard, you know, all newspapers are in decline and it's very hard to work out whether that's as a result of the criminality in News Corporation or just the sort of disruptive power of the internet. But mm. there's no doubt about it, the, 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 the Murdoch papers in particular during election time, they back particular candidates, and you know, I hope that people would say that that's not an appropriate thing for newspapers to do. Now, not surprisingly, you find yourself the attention of the uh, the national broadsheet, the Australian uh, yeah. today. You were down at a radio broadcast in Torquay, in Victoria. Full disclosure, I was part of that radio broadcast as, an ABC as well. Radio broadcast, yeah. uh, yes. ABC local radio broadcaster. Photographer took a particular interest. Yeah, he was sort of following me around. His name was Stuart. He was a very nice man, and I felt a little bit sorry for him that he'd been tasked to sort of uh, get an embarrassing photograph of me. So, um, luckily, through social media, I managed to get a photograph of him and stick him on my Twitter and feed. Looking at Christian Kerr's copy, uh, the journalist who wrote the story, Mr. Watson is a large man with a fondness for double lunches, but his funky frames and hipster shoes show he is not without vanity. 
Uh, I don't know who this guy is. Uh, no, he's never spoken to me or asked me about my uh, fondness for uh, footwear, but uh, so I, I, apologize, I apologize to him if he thinks I don't dress appropriately. Christian Kerr didn't ring you and ask you any questions and didn't interview you? No, no, no. Never heard of him. It's interesting. It, it is very interesting. Well, it's, it's what a journalist normally does, is actually ask a few questions of its subject. Yeah, although, uh, you know, I've got an unusual relationship with Rupert Murdoch and his papers. They, they don't ring me very often these days, they, although they do put me under covert surveillance. So, uh, you know, <laughs> you get used to it after a while. So, um, and are you taking or have you taken any actions as a result of the surveillance you were put under by the Murdoch press? N no, in fact, um, it, it, it led to, during our parliamentary inquiry, James Murdoch apologised and said that the surveillance was inappropriate. But but, um, you, you know, it didn't lead to any change in the corporate culture of the company, as far as I can see. And does any of this just finally um, cow you, or does it does it lead you to think that maybe you should take a backward step in pursuing your your criticism to the Murdoch press? I guess it just makes me more determined as an elected member in the UK and w wanting to talk to other politicians and to people who are worried about this kind of thing, and to make sure that people understand just exactly how Rupert Murdoch leads his companies.